Thank you. Uh, my name's Ellie. I'm a PhD student at UWA. And I'm going to be presenting a paper I've recently submitted where I've been using aggregated mobile phone location data to measure how people are exposed to different food outlets as they move around the city um, and how that differs between demographic groups. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you and acknowledge Place Intelligence because they provided the data that enabled me to do this study. So a bit of background, just quickly, why am I doing this? We've got rising rates of disease globally. Uh, so about 63% of deaths are now due to non-communicable diseases. So these are things like cancer, cardiovascular di disease, obesity. And in Australia, about 63% of adults are overweight or obese. Um, and 50% are managing a chronic condition. And this isn't shared equally across the demographic groups. So if you look at this graph, you can see that the lowest socioeconomic groups are actually carrying about one and a half times the burden, total burden of disease than the highest group. This increasing rates of poor health have been attributed to four modifiable risk factors, of which one is unhealthy diet, and that's what I'm looking at today. So what is the foodscape? Um, this is the built food environment, so it's all the outlets where you go to purchase your food. It's thought that this impacts our diet through both exposure and access. So um, access is physically going there to purchase your food or to consume your food. Exposure is what you see as you go about your daily activities. Um, and the theory is that exposure is reinforcing or modifying these normative eating behaviours through regular visual cues. So if you regularly see uh, McDonald's or you regularly see fast food wrappers lying around on the floor, um, that's a visual cue to you that that's something that's normal to eat and you're more likely to eat it. That's the theory. So what are we doing? Uh, we thought it would be interesting, given that lower socioeconomic groups are experiencing poorer health outcomes, it'd be good to know what sort of food environments or foodscapes they're being exposed to and they have access to throughout their daily activities. Um, so that's what I'm presenting today. How do we measure exposure to the foodscape? Well, we need to get an idea of daily mobility. And these are the frequently visited locations um, that you go to throughout, your, throughout the week, throughout the month, and the trajectories between them. Um, so you can see this is a bit of a schematic that gives you an idea of um, what that means. So you've got your home and your work, which are your most frequently visited locations usually. Uh, and then you've got other places like school, supermarket, friends places that you regularly go to. And then the um, trajectories that you get, the, the means of which you get to them. So we're measuring this using something called activity spaces. Uh, there's lots of ways of defining activity spaces. Um, I'll explain how we did it later. Um, but this is the area that contains those locations and the trajectories. The traditional means of measuring activity spaces include things like travel diaries, interviews and GPS trackers. But to get an idea of exposure, we need longitudinal data on activity spaces. So we need to get data collected over a reasonably long period of time. Challenges with these traditional methods include things like participant recall. Um, I don't know if you can remember where you were a month ago, so often people just don't have it in their head. Um, also, a willingness to wear a GPS tracker for an extended period of time. A lot of people might not be comfortable doing that. Um, and then processing the large amounts of data that come out of this. Um, so the longer we collect data for, the more data we have to deal with to analyse. So we thought we would deal with some of these challenges by using what's known as aggregated mobile phone location data. Um, this was provided by Place Intelligence for the entire of the southwest corner. We looked at just greater, the Greater Perth region um, and we were given it from January to December of 2019. So we had an entire year's worth of data covering the entire Perth metro area. Um, this data is collected passively by the applications on your smartphone. So when you download something and it asks you if you're okay with it collecting your location, it's very possible that that app is then selling that on to a company that then aggregates it based on your device ID and then it ends up in the hands of someone like Place Intelligence. So our data set has quite a lot of devices. It's a very big CSV file that we're given. They're anonymised, uh, so we only have device ID, uh, the location data and the horizontal accuracy data. Um, the accuracy is quite good. It uses the phone's Wi-Fi and GPS, which means the location data is actually quite accurate. Um, it has been used reasonably extensively by researchers in the last couple of years that are measuring COVID stay-at-home orders, um, particularly in the US. Obviously, there's issues with it, um, which I'm sure a lot of you thought of the minute I said your smartphone <laughs> location data. Um, one of them is the bias. Uh, so there's dem demographic differences in the apps that people use, how they use the apps, how they use their smartphones, how the apps collect data. 
Um, I personally don't actually always carry a smartphone with me, um, so a lot of people don't even use smartphones, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, the companies, though, do pay a lot of attention to try and minimise the bias in the data. They've got processes to try and do that. Um, I guess the other issue is privacy. Um, there's European studies that have found that with only four geolocated points, it's possible to identify someone. I think you can probably imagine that if someone could see where your home was and where your work was, probably where your kid's school was, it wouldn't be too hard to figure out who you are. Um, so that's something we had to address with this study. Right, so how do we do it? I'm going to go through the methods really quickly so I have time to talk a bit more about the results. If you have questions, just ask afterwards. We had to create a food outlet data set, so we needed to know what does the foodscape look like in Perth. So we did this using data from Yelp, OpenStreetMap and FuelWatch. Um, using this, we were able to create a typology of the foodscape so we could identify zones of differing characteristics of the foodscape in the Perth metro area. And we also calculated a bunch of measures of accessibility and diversity around all of the mesh blocks in Perth. It's a polygon provided by the ABS that covers about 30 to 60 residential dwellings. So that was the resolution that we're looking at for the study. Then we needed to prepare the mobile phone location data. So first thing we did was identify device home mesh blocks. So not their home addresses, but their home mesh blocks. Um, we then went back to the data and removed all the devices and their points that didn't have a home. Um, we ended up with about 6,000 to 11,000 devices per month. And we also removed all of the data that was collected in a device's home mesh block because we weren't interested in data that was collected in their home. We we're interested in the data that's being collected as they move around the city so we can see where they're going. We ended up with a set of geolocated points which had um, the ID of the device that generated it, the home mesh block ID of that device, and then we also added the index of education and occupation decile of that home mesh block. So that's the index of the area in which that device is most likely living. So once we had that, we wanted to calculate the activity spaces of those deciles and then the associated exposure to the foodscape. So for each of the deciles, we selected only the points that were assigned to that decile. Um, in this way, aggregating this way, we're able to protect the privacy of each device, so we weren't calculating the activity space of an individual device and seeing where it's going. We then calculated that activity space using what's known as kernel density estimation. The output of this is a surface showing the probability density function that's based on point data, of the available point data. Um, and that density gives us an indication of the likelihood that people in that, or devices in that decile were exposed to a particular area based on the density of the points nearby. Once we had that, we could calculate exposure. So we did this in two ways. One was to calculate weighted averages of the accessibility and diversity measures. And we did this using the density as the weights. And then we also calculated the proportion of the total density that was in each of those foodscape typologies. So this is what the Perth foodscape looks like. We found six typologies which are characterised by different levels of diversity and abundance of different foodscapes, of different food outlets. Uh, so the first one is what would be considered an inner city or entertainment zone and these are places like Perth CVD, Fremantle, West Leaderville, Subiaco, um, some of the bigger shopping centres like Carousel where you have quite a lot of eating out outlets. Then we've got what we consider suburban, diverse and high access. This is number two. Um, these are concentrated around the central areas, and more established suburbs of Perth. We've got suburban, diverse and low access, which sounds a bit strange, but it just means that we maybe they only had three outlets nearby, but they were three different ones. So they had supermarkets, restaurants and a small store rather than three restaurants. And then we have suburban, poor or no access. And these are all of the yellow and orange ones. And you can see they're concentrated around the eastern periphery of the metro area and also to the south. And these are places that didn't really have any food within a reasonable distance. If they did have food, it was maybe heavily weighted towards convenience stores or towards fast food. Uh, in general, the Perth food environment isn't particularly healthy, I guess. It has a very low prevalence of fruit and veg outlets and meat and fish, so core food outlets. Um, and it's really dominated by restaurants and cafes. And this isn't just fancy restaurants that you find in the city. It might be also a snack shop that you find out in the suburbs um, where you can get your meat and meat pie and chips. So these are the IEO deciles and the activity spaces that we calculated for them. This is the um, 
Perth metro area coloured according to the decile of um, the SA1s. Uh, so you can see the lowest deciles and these are the lowest people with the lowest skill level working in low skilled jobs or unemployed or with a very low level of education and these are really clearly concentrated to the eastern, in the eastern periphery and to the south of Perth. What we found with their activity spaces was that the activity is being increasingly concentrated in the Perth CBD um, and those central western suburbs as, as the level of education skill increases. So this is the highest decile and you can see that it's, there's a very high concentration around the Perth CBD, Subiaco, Leadville, Highgate, those sorts of areas and western suburbs and around the river. It's got quite a small area too compared to some of the others. Look at number nine, it's similar, um, but still in this central area. And as we go down this level of skill and education, it sort of um, starts to disperse, starts to become more suburban and starts to end up more in the peripheries of the city. So you can start to see commuting here. Um, there's still a very high concentration of activity in that CBD area. Uh, and then we start to get down... Well, this is number two, so this is one of the lowest ones, and you can see that the suburban centres are starting to become...